Um, Tom is a research fellow at the University of Southampton. So he's currently working with Damon Teagle on behavior and enrichment mechanisms on precious and critical metals in the subsea floor hydrothermal systems, as well as doing loads of cool novel laser ablation uh, techniques, including making fun powder pellets, which we've just spent a very geeky afternoon talking about, which I very much enjoyed. Um, so Tom is from the Isle of Wight, but when you talk to him, you'll notice that he has a distinctly un Isle of Wight accent, and that's because he grew up in New Zealand and um, did his undergrad also in New Zealand at in Wellington. So he was telling me earlier that he spent a very eye-opening summer in Northern Canada doing some mineral exploration. And after that, he moved to Switzerland to do his PhD where he worked on, first of all, the Alps, and then on looking at some geological mapping in Oman, which is what he's gonna be talking about today. So in um, March 2020, Tom, Tom co-founded the Ore Deposits Hub, and I'm sure lots of you have um, seen the fantastic seminars they've been doing. So thank you so much, Tom, for doing that. That was really good during lockdown. And excitingly, in 2022, he's going to be off on a uh, sailing IODP cruise going across the Atlantic to drill into the ocean crust, which sounds really, really cool. Right, OK, I'm going to shut up now. So thank you so much, Tom, for coming over and... Yeah. Take it away. Oh, that's, yeah, that's one that's popping. <laughs> Great. Okay, I can't see myself. I can't see my mirror. Thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction and for the invite. Yeah, it's great to come over here. It wasn't too far. <laughs> uh, I came over on a hovercraft, which I thought was pretty cool. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk uh, about modern geological mapping, mainly from the perspective of uh, a recently completed mapping project in Oman that I did as part of my PhD. Uh, at the University of Bern. I wonder if, should we turn the light down on the top of the- Yeah, thing? it that... goes very, very dark, but that's, um, we can turn it down so that we'll be, we'll be sort of plunged into darkness. I think it's okay. worth it. That's good, that's good. It's only for that. At the home, they might, you might look like a ghost now, but that's all right. They'll manage. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was, uh, I'll use the mouse here, everyone can see, uh, done at yeah. the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, and it was mainly funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, but also closely supported by our friends at uh, National Earth Secrets in Muscat, uh, the Institute for Rock Magnetism at the University of Minnesota, uh, and the ITC at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Some of what I talk about might seem a little obvious to some of you. Uh, hopefully it won't seem obvious to all of you. And uh, at the very least, everyone will take away some nice pictures of pillow lavas. <coughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. Now I'm probably going to go for two slides. Uh, so here's a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Firstly, some sort of generalized strategies uh, to apply to geological mapping. You can hopefully apply to your own mapping. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the smile ophiolite uh, and our mapping project. Then we'll sort of systematically go through the volcanic mapping uh, portion of that project and then the alteration mapping portion of that project. And then finally, try and extract some take home messages uh, that you can apply to your own projects. So yeah, as we get into any project, right, we need a good strategy. Uh, we've been talking about strategy all afternoon uh, from a laser perspective, and it's the same for mapping. Uh, and the key thing to do there at the beginning is to define the units that you want to map, what units are actually mappable. And the most important thing to think about at that stage is how do I improve the utility of what's already there? You know, the entire Earth's surface has already been mapped to some extent, the geology of it. Uh, so what do you do if you're going to spend your time and effort and money on it had better improve what's already there, either by splitting something that was previously lumped or by improving something that was previously uh, not mapped very well. <clears throat> Our next step is to figure out what kind of reference data we want to generate. And I mean that very broadly uh, in terms of things like field work, sampling, collecting geochemistry, even things like dating are very important for mapping. Uh, and literature compilation, right, uh, et cetera. You've got to be opportunistic here. Uh, take what you can, use whatever you can. But the kind of reference data that we want to generate is going to be very strongly influenced by uh, this next step, and that's what kind of uh, continuous geospatial data, basically raster data, it tends to be, uh, we have to help interpret and interpolate, infer between those fixed reference points. Uh, 
things like geophysics, satellite imagery, you know, again, most of the Earth's surface has been covered to some extent by geophysical surveys or uh, certainly by satellite imagery several times over by missions like Landsat, uh, ASTA, now Sentinel, etc. It changes every few years. So <clears throat> it's this sort of symbiotic combination of things, right, that lets us efficiently and powerfully map large areas uh, in a sort of cost-efficient, time-efficient manner. And then finally, you know, in terms of 21st century geological mapping, uh, the way we, the outputs, the outputs of our maps have changed quite a bit uh, from the 20th century, let's say. Uh, maps these days are now produced almost entirely digitally, and they're going to be consumed digitally as well, uh, rather than uh, on paper. The way we publish these maps is also changing. Uh, whereas geological maps have previously been the sort of domain of geological surveys for publication, as, as mapping projects get more high tech, more complicated, and we bring in academics from research institutions like this one, or like myself, you know, we have a sort of different currency to geological survey academics. Uh, I need, my, my funder wants me, uh, my CV wants me to publish results in peer reviewed journals, uh, not just maps. So that sort of output. Uh, the way you're going to publish your map is something important to discuss at the beginning of the project. Uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, <clears throat> a modern geological map should be recyclable. Uh, by that, I basically mean editable. Uh, whereas an, a 20th century geological map might have ended in a, a paper product, uh, that's an incredibly useful product, but it's also a bit of a dead end. Uh, these days, with the proliferation of online uh, repositories and archives, there's no real excuse not to uh, archive uh, permanently the raw data, the base level data that you put into your map, such that when the next person inevitably comes along, just like you did, uh, to remap an area, they can start off exactly where you left off. <clears throat> and then finally, licensing. Uh, that's basically the same uh, point as publications, right? Uh, my funder, as an academic, wants me to publish everything open access, everything funded by the government. Uh, it's probably the same for you, or it could be. Uh, but again, that's quite different to the traditional uh, map publishing route uh, where we sell geological maps piece by piece from a survey. Uh, so yeah, something to straighten out at the beginning of the project and not argue about at the end. So let's jump right in. Uh, I'll keep moving this thing around. You can, you can minimize it. I'll just minimize it. Huh? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> jump straight into the Smilo, if you like. I suppose it's called Samalo, if you like, with an A. Uh, here, outlined in white along the northeastern tip of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, that is the biggest exposed ophelite on Earth at around 17,000 square kilometers of outcrop. Uh, it's spectacular. Stretches from the UAE, or actually from Oman up here, this little uh, Musandam Peninsula, through the UAE into northeast Oman down to near Muscat. It was formed around 95 million years ago. Uh, well, firstly, what, what an ophelite is, well, it's, it's a tectonic nap of ocean atmosphere, you know, comprising both mantle, uh, lower mantle sections, a lower crustal gabbroic section, an upper crustal lava and dike section. And uh, that ocean atmosphere was formed around 95 million years ago in the Cretaceous, and then thrust fairly shortly afterwards onto the Arabian margin here to the southwest. And uh, what we see is this thrust sheet. Uh, and after being in place there, it was folded uh, gently with a sort of anticlinal hinge there down the back of the Hajar Mountains. And what that's done is expose a beautiful oblique cross section through the oceanless sphere here along its trailing edge and some other cross sections in other parts of the ocean like too. And there we can access, you know, the entire sequence basically in place uh, of uh, peridotites, gabbros and upper crust, which is why we study it. Is just a simple you know, cross-section of that uh, after Mike's sale. And then zooming in, you can see exactly the same thing in outcrop. There's a pile of pillar lavas. Uh, if you know how a pillar lava is shaped, you can see they're tilted. And that's draped with a, uh, a metalliferous sediment, perhaps issued from a nearby hydrothermal vent. That's in turn covered into more lavas. And the whole thing has been tilted uh, 30 degrees to the east. So. Uh, why should we produce maps in Oman or at all? Uh, 
personally, I don't really think we need good reasons to produce uh, great geological maps. You know, they're enablers and their frameworks, and they produce the questions themselves uh, and the answers. Uh, but we did come up with some reasons in Oman, and that, of course, helps you get the project funded, which is important. Uh, <clears throat> and in Bern, we were interested in these black smoker type ore deposits. So these are sulfide deposits that we think uh, are formed of the seafloor where hot hydrothermal vents uh, cool, uh, dump all their minerals at a vent site, chimneys like this. And if those accumulations, those dump sites get shifted up onto land by tectonics, like they did in Oman, and we can access them. We call them volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, VMS deposits. And the ones in Oman, uh, there's quite a few of them, 20 or so, uh, have been an important source of copper, but also uh, gold, zinc, and a bit of silver for more than 6,000 years. Uh, and this resource continues to be very important because uh, technology is related to uh, replacing traditionally fossil fuel powered uh, industry and technology tend to use a lot of copper, you know, upgrading national grids, uh, electric cars, uh, wind turbines, all contain a lot of copper and the price of copper and demand for it has been creeping up accordingly. The other side of this coin, uh, the academic interest in the ophiolite, uh, you know, it's an archetypal exposure of oceanic crust, especially of uh, fast spreading oceanic crust. And over the last 40 years, some eight, 9,000 articles have been published on it, uh, culminating recently in the International Continental Drilling Project, uh, <coughs> Oman Drilling Project. So there's academic interest there too. So we'll go back to that, that strategy that I went through before, applied to this project. First, we're gonna define our mappable units. Uh, so the existing maps, fantastic pieces of work produced by French and Japanese groups in the 80s and 90s uh, and Omanis, uh, differentiated just two volcanic units here. So a lower basal unit, invariably V1 or geotimes, phase one, SE1, uh, that's co-magmatic with a sheeted dike complex, uh, which means that it formed at the axial spreading ridge. Uh, <clears throat> and then a undifferentiated a V2 lava unit on top of all those, uh, that axial crust. In the literature, however, we've long known about the existence of at least four lava units in Oman. Uh, four regionally distributed lava units and one locally distributed one. And they have different petrogenetic uh, significances and different VMS deposit uh, implications. So the simple goal of this mapping project was to uh, update the existing maps uh, to this sort of state-of-the-art figure fit. A further drive to split these maps came from the findings of Sam Gilgan, that the VMS deposits hosted in this upper unit were or tend to be gold rich and the ones hosted by the geotimes unit tend to be copper rich. <clears throat> so let's go on a little uh, field tour to the ophiolite, to these map units, starting with the sheeted dikes. Uh, we think they formed it uh, by a mechanism sort of broadly comparable to a modern fast spreading ocean ridge, uh, except they have a kind of uh, subduction flavor. Uh, so we interpret them forming above some kind of nascent subduction zone, like a young subduction zone, here. maybe roughly looking like this cartoon. And that, that outcrop there is about five meters high. And you can see these successively intruded, almost vertical dikes, right? They've been intruded up one after the other as the plate was, the two plates were spreading apart at this ocean ridge. Those dikes fed uh, these comagmatic pillow lavas. Uh, this is probably the most photographed pillow lava outcrop uh, <laughs> in the world. Uh, but I think my photo is great. I went out on a cloudy day, which is pretty rare. And uh, Ali is there for scale. And there again, they're very much more blight. Uh, if you look at from a distance like this, and if you look a little bit closer, they have this distinct subduction sort of seasoning. On top of that, I'm oh, sorry, this, this line has jumped down a bit. We have this uh, sort of discontinuous accumulations of primitive basalts called the LaSalle unit. They're almost like sea mounts. They're usually a few hundred meters thick, spaced every 10 to 40 kilometers atop the axial crust. On top of that, more continuously, we have this alley group of units, which is uh, made up of a lower foliated alley series. Uh, it's a fractionated lava series from facile through to rhyolite. So you get a little bit of everything in there. Uh, we think this formed in sort of post-axial setting. So either the spreading ridge had migrated away or it had stopped spreading. <clears throat> and then the bononitic uh, portion of 
uh, that lava group. Uh, bononites are a kind of funky lava composition. It's relatively rare overall, uh, but actually quite common in ophiolites, especially near the top and in these, these nascent arc settings, so early subduction settings. And basically that's a lava which has unusually high magnesium for a given silica content. <clears throat> and finally, the post-volcanic sediments. Uh, these were already mapped very well in the existing regional maps, but I like the photo, so I threw it in anyway. Uh, for those who don't like lavas, uh, basically here we have the top of the Ophiolite volcanic sequence, uh, some blocky volcanic plastics, all altered. And draped on top of that, we have a metalliferous uh, umber, metalliferous sediment, uh, sort of recording the shutdown of the hydrothermal systems at the top of the sequence. Uh, and those grade into some radiolarian cherts. So uh, basically metal free, just silica in those very deep water sediments. And those in turn grade up into a foraminiferal limestone. And this, this transition here is recording uh, some combination of the uplift of the ophiolite through the carbonate compensation depth on its way onto the continent, uh, and possibly also the deepening of the CCD at the end of the Cretaceous uh, warm period. So useful reference data. Uh, we have our four units. The kind of questions we need to ask are, what properties might be systematically different between them? And then what sort of geospatial data, what raster data is available uh, that could take advantage of this? They're basically the same question uh, and they will control what sort of reference or training data we want to spend our precious time and money collecting. So we know the geochemistry of these units changes up to geography. Uh, but geochemistry is quite hard to map at a big scale. And we have several hundred kilometer mapping area. Uh, our experience just walking around in the field and checking with these little field magnets uh, suggested that there are systematic differences in magnetism between the units. Uh, and that's a really good example of how sort of basic little field observations, noting down things, can sort of lead on to bigger things later, later on down the line. Uh, because there was a suitable uh, raster data set available to take a bunch of that. Uh, we had an aeromagnetic survey flown in the 90s um, provided by the government. So that told us what sort of reference data we needed to collect. Uh, obviously field observations, traditional geological mapping, uh, some samples, uh, compilation of literature maps, and then we needed to make some geochemical and rock magnetic analyses on those samples. <clears throat> in terms of collecting uh, that field data, that might have changed a bit since the 20th century. We did this entire project using GPS guided tablets. Uh, you know, it takes three or four hours to drive from one end of the field area to another. So we couldn't map everything and like aerially. Instead, we used sort of strategic transects, uh, lots of transects up and down the Ophiolite. And we visited areas that were problematic, that had weird structures uh, that just couldn't figure out looking at the aeromag or the existing maps. Uh, but the, you know, sitting on a hill, it's the best place to, looking down on it, it's the best place to figure it out. <clears throat> the advantages of going digital here for this collection, a uh, big one is that at the end of each day or the end of the, uh, at the end of your field work, your field season, you can just collate all that data together in a few clicks. You know, it takes a few minutes and you have everything in one place, all mapped with the same system. Uh, another one we could take any kind of spatial data we could imagine into the field, georeferenced underneath our little GPS point and look at it. Uh, so the existing maps, our working maps, the Aramag, all of that, uh, super helpful with the under overlays, transparencies and so on, can really make decisions. As I said, sitting on a hill, looking at the geology, everything in your hand, that's the place to make hard mapping decisions. And then finally, uh, structural data collection, lots of structural geologists here. Uh, Rick Almendinger made a nice review of that a few years ago in JSG. Uh, you can very rapidly collect a lot of structural data with these tablets, uh, linked to your field observations, linked to your photos, and obviously geolocated. And there's some structures I collected over one field season. And then finally, anyone who's digitized field books, I think most people still do that, <clears throat> will know that the export capabilities of these digital devices is pretty awesome. Saves you a lot of time, saves you calling up, students who have gone on to another institute and taken their field books with them uh, and you need to get that base level data at the end of each field season everyone gives me their uh, their excel files their whole map files and i have that base data 
archivable one place and you know ready for the next user okay so it wasn't always as easy to tell those uh, lavas apart as it looked in those photos and this is sort of just an example of the kind of strategic uh, extra work you can do to help with your mapping uh, in those cases we relied on the geochemistry of samples to tell us where we were in the stratigraphy and in terms of time cost and effort Obviously, the easiest way to do that is to take an analysis that's already been published and geolocated. Uh, there's been 40 years of research in the OFU light. There was plenty of those. Uh, so we compiled those. The second trickiest thing to do, or the uh, tricking, trickiest in terms of order, was to sample ourselves. There are plenty of that too. Uh, more than 200 samples were collected, shipped back to Bern, and then analyzed by the relatively high throughput XRF uh, Holrock method. I saw you have one downstairs uh, and we use lithium borate glasses and that has pretty good throughput at least 10 samples per day once you've sort of gotten used to the method uh, giving you very accurate major elements and some key immobile trace elements like zirconium yttrium finally <clears throat> uh, if these two didn't work uh, we could fall back to uh, an icpms method that gets us our trace elements all our trace elements uh, and the highest throughput ICPMS method we had in Bern was this nanoparticulate powder pellet laser ablation ICPMS. And that basically involves remilling a powder that was intended for XRF uh, in water in a little agate planetary ball mill at 600 hertz, uh, make a really fine powder, nano powder, and then press it into a pellet and sample it with a laser. Uh, like that, we could go pretty quickly, also avoid the use of acids and get all our major and trace elements at the same time. Those data, uh, because you know the, the biggest part of our data set was collected by XRF, uh, sort of lent themselves to these classic tectonic diagrams for discriminating lavas, uh, developed in the heyday of ophiolite studies in the 70s and 80s, um, relying on elements, sort of minor and high-level trace elements like titanium, zirconium, vanadium, etc. And they split apart the ophiolite series really well. We're basically to find fields based on published literature analyses, uh, draw circles around them and all the diagrams, plot our unknowns in them, then go from diagram to diagram and assign it to a unit like that. And at the end, what you have is a really reliable sort of tie point for your map. Uh, <clears throat> something, you know, when you have two, you can interpret between them. So together that makes up our sort of point reference data all of that is vector data or polygons drawn on the map too. Uh, maps, field observation samples. And to interpret between that, we want to use our raster data or a more continuous data set. And for that, we had our AeroMag. That's a reduced to pole air magnetic survey. Now, if you have more questions about it, I might be able to answer them. So I don't know if any of you have ever interpreted an aeromagnetic survey before, uh, but structural interpretation can often be pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, humans are really good at picking out lineaments in, in, in patterns in, uh, in maps like this. And you can make very powerful interpretation without knowing anything really about the actual magnetic properties of the units that you're mapping. Uh, so here's an example of that. We had in the uh, previous existing maps, sheeted dikes, this is sort of a Northeast dipping section here, uh, the sheeted dikes at the base uh, mapped conformably up against the V2 or the SE2 lavas. And according to our stratigraphy, that shouldn't happen. Uh, so it's suspicious, right? We took a closer look. And on the AeroMag, we saw this very continuous demagnetized lineament running roughly along where that contact was mapped uh, for around 40 kilometers, you know, even further than this figure shows. So that suggests there's a fault there. You know, it's too continuous for some uh, stratigraphic feature. Uh, and like that, we could just go and visit a couple of localities, a couple of transects, confirm there was a fault there. And then very quickly, you know, with just two days of field work, we've mapped basically the, the extent of that fault for 40 kilometers. In terms of actually interpreting what units are between those faults, uh, that takes a little more information. And you need to ask yourself, what is my geophysical survey actually sensitive to? You know, whether it varies statistically between my units, uh, and then of course, why it varies between my units. Uh, this is critical because it tells you something about how reliable it's going to be, you know, and in what situations uh, it might not work. 
So to do that, uh, <clears throat> I traveled to the Institute for Rock Magnetism in Minnesota and measured a representative subset of my samples uh, with Andrea Biedem in there for their magnetic properties. That was great fun. This thing looked a bit like a lightsaber. I loved it. And uh, <clears throat> we measured the bulk magnetic properties and the magnetic mineralogy of all these samples. Uh, so here's magnetic susceptibility. That's basically the magnetism of a sample in, in a magnetic field, induced in a magnetic field. Uh, it's a proxy basically for the total ferromagnetic mineral content in the sample, like magnetite. And then the natural rem remnant magnetism, uh, that's kind of the permanent component of magnetism in the sample, uh, locked in as that, as that rock cooled through a Curie temperature or the magnetic minerals crystallized. Uh, they're kind of, they're related properties, right? It's basically the magnetism of the rock. And fortuitously, uh, what we found, uh, confirming our little, uh, you know, our little field tests, was that we have this kind of barcode magnetism up to the sugar thing. And it's good that it was arranged that way because any other way would have been nearly half as useful. Uh, <clears throat> we have a high, high magnetism, low, high, low. Uh, and like that, you know, if you're sitting on a tholeitic alley outcrop here, and in the Aramag, you can see these stripes above and below you, you can make a pretty good guess of what those are going to be. To figure out why that was happening and what situations it might not hold, uh, we compared those magnetic properties to geochemistry. Here, that's magnetic susceptibility again, so basically magnetite content, uh, up against magnesium number. It's a chemical proxy uh, that characteristically decreases with evolution from a basaltic to a rhyolitic composition. Uh, and what we saw, I mean, I, I just said, you know, in, hind, in hindsight, this kind of seems obvious, but at the beginning, we really had no idea what was causing these variations. Uh, we had this hypothesis that maybe these were calcalkaline lavas, magnets that sort have of fractionated all their magnetite before they got to the surface. And then the opposing hypothesis was that they were just so primitive that they didn't have enough iron in them to make much uh, magnetite. And it turned out uh, that the data supported the latter. Uh, all those weak magnetic uh, samples and units cluster at very, very high magnesium number. And then we sort of go up to higher magnetic susceptibilities and lower magnesium numbers in the, in the green and red units there. Uh, basically, that's mirroring the tholeite, sort of classic tholeite fractionation trend for those who are familiar with that. Uh, so that's great. We know that it's a primary magmatic property of the, of the units that on average it probably will hold in outcrop. A uh, different level of evolution means that it might not hold and that it would be very susceptible to a strong alteration uh, that would totally transform the rock. So here's an example where it did work really well. Uh, this is the northeast dipping section through uh, the upper oceanic crust. So on the southwest here of the box, we have sheeted dikes, a little intrusive complex, and then a strip of uh, these V1 lavas, SE1 lavas. And on top of that, a thick package of uh, undifferentiated V2 lavas, or SE2 lavas. So <clears throat> if we look at the mag, we see, yeah, okay, this sort of highly magnetic strip where geotimes is just about. And then above that, that V2 package is split into a weakly magnetic domain and a strongly magnetic domain. If we think back to our, our baseline study, uh, we would interpret this right as being a lasile layer, a weakly magnetic lasile layer, and this one is a strongly magnetic foliated galley layer. So we went to the field, walked a couple of transects, took a couple of samples, you know, all in all, that's less than half a day's work and <clears throat> confirmed that it was indeed the case. Uh, and sort of with minimal field work there, we were able to, with quite some accuracy, trace the contact. First, we split that package, but also split it uh, along the contact with some detail, uh, both in outcrop, uh, you can see that's just an outcrop map we already had, and under gravel cover. Uh, so the area that we've mapped here is much larger than, than was already there, mm -hmm. thanks to this uh, aramag interpretation. The final result, uh, basically applying that to the whole ophiolite, ended up with 1,200 kilometers of outcrop mapped and expanded to 2,100 kilometers of bedrock, which is great if you're looking for VMS deposits hidden under under the gravel, you know, because all the ones that are already outcropping have been found, right? Uh, we distributed it as a fully editable and georeferenced geospatial PDF, uh, along with an explanatory manuscript uh, to keep the funders happy, keep me happy, uh, and all the data sets archived open access at Bangale. Uh, 
Okay, sorry. The alteration mapping example, it'll be quicker, I promise. Uh, starting off with a really simple VMS system model uh, that envisages cold seawater infiltrating through the crust that are something like an axial spreading ridge, uh, getting heated up, leaching metals, becoming buoyant above this hot magma chamber and shooting back up to the surface uh, before cooling and dumping its metals in a pile at a VMS deposit. Along this circuit, uh, we think sort of characteristic alteration types occur uh, depending on how evolved the fluid is from its interaction with the, with the lavas as it goes around. Uh, to start with, we form this sort of regional alteration uh, called spillites, characterized by chloride or smectite and albite. Uh, deeper in the system, and we actually don't really know where these, these rocks fit, but we do find a few of them in Oman. Uh, we find uh, basically amphibolites made up of actinolite or hornblende. Uh, further along the system, again, uh, this is something that recently we sort of now think is less connected to the VMS deposits uh, than this model suggests. Uh, we can find epidocytes, uh, rocks transformed to epidotent quartz, and uh, still interesting parts of the hydrothermal system. And then right beneath the VMS deposit, uh, we expect to find a chloritite rock or really strongly chloride altered rock, along maybe with some pyrite and quartz. <clears throat> so those are our target units. We can ask ourselves the same set of questions. You know, what varies between them? Uh, obviously, the mineralogy varies. That's what this is. This is a mineralogical transformation uh, that generally corresponds to a change in magnetism because magnetite is pretty easily altered. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, on top of the um, primary magnetic variations we already talked about, uh, the resolution of that Aramag survey is not really high enough to pick out these small alteration zones. Uh, but what varies uh, very systematically between these unit types is basically their color. I mean, you can already see that in the pictures, right? But in infrared, the color really varies and in a very uh, reliable manner. Uh, and there is a great uh, continuous geospatial data set available to take advantage of that, uh, especially because we're working in an arid desert without any vegetation, uh, basically whatsoever. Uh, and that's the ASTA, it's a remote sensing data set, multispectral archive. It covers the earth several times over. Uh, so we could download this multispectral infrared imagery uh, for the whole field area uh, for free, thanks to NASA. Uh, <clears throat> and that informed us, you know, what sort of reference data we needed to collect uh, to most efficiently interpret that data. Uh, a mixture of sample reflectance spectra, these M member type alteration types, uh, but most importantly, field mapped areas of intense alteration with which we could train up our, our ASTA classifiers. So uh, to map those alteration zones, uh, basically we went to places in the literature where this, these alteration types have been described and mapped across from uh, the background alteration through the zone back into the background. Uh, so complete geological mapping of the alteration. Uh, we did that just like normal field work with a hammer and a hand lens, uh, but we were supported by a uh, field spectrometer, which is a really cool bit of kit. He's showing its age now, but, uh, uh, but it was handy. We could put it in the back of the car or most of the time we had it by the sofa uh, where we were staying and basically make sure we we're mapping what we thought we were. <clears throat> uh, just like for the geochemistry, we also took samples uh, back home, shipped them off, uh, took them up to the ITC at the University of Twente and use their slightly fancier spectrometer uh, to measure the reflectance spectra of those. Those are leaves, but you can, you can easily imagine a rock in its place. And those results are sort of summarized there. There are squiggly colorful lines. Uh, and what you see on top of them in black is basically those squiggly lines uh, resampled to what the ASTA sensor would see. And the ASTA sensor, in the sense of getting a bit old now, was launched in 1998. And uh, that only has nine bands uh, in this wavelength range, uh, you know, whereas the ASD has like 300 or 250 or something. Uh, but we can see there are differences, systematic differences between these alteration types, also similarities. <clears throat> but these, the, these uh, sort of lab spectra were really only supportive uh, of the more important as the spectra that we extracted directly from those field mapped areas. Uh, that's what matters. You know, those image spectra take into account all the error, cumulative error of the 
uh, atmospheric correction of the surface conditions, of weathering conditions, et cetera. If we can tell those spectra apart in the astro imagery, that means we can actually map them. And we could. They were pretty similar, uh, but there are small differences between these spectra. And it's those small differences uh, that we took advantage of uh, with our classifiers to sort of pull them apart and make these maps. <clears throat> to actually apply those classifiers, we needed a big uh, mosaic, right, of all the astro imagery. Uh, those are, I can't remember, 29 scenes or something in there, each 60 by 60 kilometers, uh, arranged in strips, and then normalized by their uh, overlapping edge uh, statistics. Here's another little example of how sort of very targeted field work can help you a lot. Uh, we took samples of some black plastic sheeting of some rather homogeneous limestone blocks riding above the ophiolite here, and use those spectra uh, to, to calibrate you know, the, the radiance that the acid sensor sees at the top of the atmosphere to something very comparable with what our field spectrometer measures, the surface reflectance, uh, giving us a nice normalized reflectance mosaic, perfect for the application of, of our, our classifiers. And here's just a couple of examples of that, thin light zone, you know, map there in the same colors, and then an alteration zone, uh, epidocyte zone here. So that worked pretty well. There's the final output of that. Uh, that's cropped to the same size as the volcanic map, but this one actually extends to the entire ophiolite crust. Uh, it covers 5,100 kilometers squared, but a 15 meters resolution. And so they're quite big files, uh, but that's great. That really allows you to interpret the shape of the alteration zones. And again, the outputs here mirror the volcanic map. You've got an explanatory journal article, everyone's happy, open access archive reference data, map product. This should be entirely reproducible uh, and reusable to anyone who wants to come along with some new reference data or some new, a new sensor, you know, new sensors come out every few years. Uh, so there's really a lot of potential here uh, to improve on what we've already done. Together, these make a, well, we think they make a powerful framework for research and for exploration targeting in Oman. Uh, and internally, you know, we've been working on, on draft versions of these for several years, and they've really helped with our research in Bern. They're pretty different mapping projects uh, with sort of similar goals, and I think very similar approaches. Uh, we carefully defined our units uh, and then decided basically what reference data was most efficient to collect based on the kind of continuous uh, geospatial data we had to interpret. Uh, the output's digital hopefully recyclable and totally open access. Finally, just say here, this sort of characteristic combination of strategic field work, careful lab work, careful desk work, uh, were all essential. You know, if you take out any one of those things, maps don't really work. So getting there, little take home messages. Well, I would say the digital devices can really superpower your mapping, whether it's just an iPhone or, or a tablet. Uh, of course, redundancy in your equipment and in your training to use those different kinds of equipment is still important. Uh, but equally, I would probably argue that uh, if your tablet runs out of superpower, you're probably best finding a new, uh, a new battery pack for it than you are mapping on paper and then going back and digitizing it later. Uh, choose the kind of field-based reference data you collect wisely uh, so that you can most powerfully interpret the kind of remote or asset data sets that you have available to you. And you've got to be resourceful on both of these fronts. Just take whatever you can get and use it. And the kind of reference data that we collect uh, will, of course, evolve along with the kind of raster data sets we have available to us. Uh, these are updating all the time. There's lots of Earth observation missions uh, launching all the time. Uh, so for that reason, I don't really see an end to, to this kind of strategic field work in sight, which should be comforting to some of you. <clears throat> so then finally, something I tried to build up over the talk, I'm not sure if it got across, uh, but this mapping project was really more than about field work and, and successful modern geological mapping will be more than about field work. Uh, it really was a team effort. And I think that crucial mapping functions uh, were equally as likely to be carried out you know, behind a monitor or mass spectrometer as behind a rock hammer or a hand lens. Uh, when you're building your team, you're gonna to need to build one uh, with diverse expertise, uh, cross-disciplinary expertise, 
uh, local knowledge, logistical knowledge, analytical facilities, access, they're all important for the modern geological mapping team. What I'm really trying to get across here uh, is that not everyone wants to go into the field or can go into the field, but that doesn't mean at all that they can't be a part of a, a successful modern geological mapping team, right? Several of my amazing team members here, they've never even been to Oman, uh, but without their contributions, the maps wouldn't have been nearly half as good as they ended up being. Uh, so thanks to them and thanks to you guys. That's, uh, that's me and I'm happy to take mm -hmm. any questions. <laughs>